Hi, Justin. Thanks for doing this. I'm so sorry that we kept you waiting. Oh, no problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we're kind of new to this. We don't know what we're doing so far. <laughs> no problem. Can you guys hear me all right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah you're fine. Cool. All, all right. right. Am I supposed to be able to see you guys or no? Oh, yeah, we can turn on the cameras. Oh, okay. Well, definitely not. <laughs> all right. How are, guys, how are you guys doing? All right. How about you? Not, not too bad at all. That's good to hear. Is it how nice? You, how are you going through with these uh, tough times? I'm doing all right. Hopefully, we'll get hockey back in the next month or so, and then right, kind of back to normal-ish. But uh, getting by, doing what I can. That's nice. That's good to hear. Yeah. How are you guys? Yeah, I'm doing all right. Yeah. Yeah, we're good. I mean, we're we're pretty much like all over the continent. Like me and Shay, we're up in Canada. Jacob's in Chicago. So. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's like minus thirty here right now, so it's nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, minus thirty. I I don't even know what that would be in Fahrenheit, but it's like fifty degrees here, which is uh. That's pretty nice. Yeah, I bet that's nice in Vegas. <laughs> yeah, it's, weather's pretty great. I was just out on my patio last night having a drink. It's 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 not the worst place to be this time of year. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> awesome. I'd be freezing if I was on my front porch right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I wasn't supposed to be recording, but I am recording. So I'm just gonna say that's the intro, and we're gonna go on with it. <laughs> oh, all right, all right. So, so I'll ask the first question. And how did you get hired by the Vegas Sun? Uh, I applied. I mean, it's. Uh, I wish I had a better story than that, but I saw a listing. Uh, the previous uh, beat writer for the first season, because I took over for the second season onward. The B first season took a different job. They had a listing. I was working at the Review Journal, the other newspaper in town, covering high school sports. And uh, I, you know, I made it clear there that I wanted to cover hockey, and it didn't work out for whatever reason. So I applied elsewhere, and uh, the editor at the Sun knew me, knew some of my work, and it worked out pretty well. That was that was over two years ago. So yeah, that's, nice. that's a big step up. <laughs> yeah, going from <laughs> high school sports to covering the nhl is uh, yeah a bit of a jump but it worked out all right i would say <laughs> nice to hear uh were you an avid hockey fan before the knights came into the league uh yes but i have not been a hockey fan my whole life um i went to school i'm originally from phoenix arizona oh. went to sc- went to school at arizona state and like it was kind of aware that the coyotes were there but <laughs> i wouldn't say that i grew up and diehard Coyotes fan, but uh, Arizona State Hockey uh, went NCAA Division One my senior year, and I kind of covered them when they were a club team from my freshman year onward, and uh, so it was Arizona State Club Hockey that got me into hockey, and then after that, I started going to as many Coyotes games as I could, and then I moved out to Vegas for work, and uh, my second year here was the Knights' first year, so uh, I wasn't on the beat at that time, so I got tickets whenever I could and went out to the games, and uh, now that I cover them, I'm out at all the games, and it's, huh. it's great. Yeah, so does that make you a big Austin Matthews fan? <laughs> I definitely like what he what he does, and uh, it's funny, because in Arizona, he's, he's a big name, despite obviously playing in Toronto, and... Uh, yeah, everybody. Austin Matthews is always a big draw now. When the Maple Leafs come to town, everybody loves to go see Matthews. He's he's big in Arizona for sure. Oh, I yeah. bet it's nice. I bet it's nice that uh, whenever the Knights are in are in Arizona, that you know you get to go to your hometown where you spent you know all your childhood memories there, right? Yep, yep. It's always nice not having. That's the one road trip I don't have to get a hotel. Just stay with <laughs> yeah. It's 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 fun going back to. Uh, uh, Gila River Arena now, it had all kinds of different names when I was growing up, but Gila River Arena where the Coyotes play, and going there now as a as a visiting reporter is a little different than going there as a fan, so it's it's cool because, you know, you make the I make the same drive out there from my parents' house to, uh, as I did when I had tickets to go with my brother, and now it's going to the press box instead of uh, the main concourse, so it's, it's definitely cool. Nice. Uh, how excited were you when you found out that Vegas was to have an NHL team? <laughs> it was awesome. I was, um, I think it got announced when I was still, like, there were rumors, I think, uh, when I was still in Arizona that it was going to happen when I was living there. And then when I moved out here into Vegas for an internship, I was working at the Review Journal when it got announced. And I was like, all right, this is great. I mean, just to, to have to have a hockey team here. And I don't think there was any question that it was going to do well among the fan base. But uh, I don't think anybody thought that they were going to be as good that first year as they ended up being. Yeah. That is true. 
Uh, um, just one thing. Um, you know, obviously the Knights have built a respectful fan base over the past couple of years. Um, how did then? You know, how did the team just impact the city of Las Vegas when they first joined? Um, you know, obviously that same week, um, there's that tragedy that killed all those um, individuals, and um, you know that must have been huge for the city to have some support. You know, it it, it definitely was. It was uh, obviously the timing was. Uh, it, I don't want to say it worked out because obviously it was, it was terrible, but the fact that it happened right then um, and then a week later, like you said, less than a week later, the Golden Knights got to play their first game and give a city that was hurting something to rally behind was was fantastic to see. And they started the first two games on the road. They beat Dallas uh, at the last minute and then they beat Arizona in overtime. I think if I'm remembering that right. And then they came home for that first game. Their first home game was their third game of the season. And they had scrapped all their inaugural plans for like, okay, we're going to do this sword in the stone gimmick and we're going to do all this, this and make it like this big crazy light show. And they made it all about the first responders from there. And I think from that moment forward, people that were, that lived in Vegas just felt a connection with this team that you can't, that you can't uh, manufacture. It had to be organic. And to see that happen right away was fantastic. And then the Golden Knights won, I think, like their first three or four home games. And then they went on an eight-game winning streak or something like that later in the year. And it was clear that this team was more than just uh, a hot start. So to go from, you know, the shooting on October 1st in 2017, um, to have an entire city that was hurting, uh, to be able to follow a team all the way to the Stanley Cup final that year, I think was was monumental and something that uh, for all of us here that were here that first year, something that will never forget. And I think fans will always kind of have that connection with the Golden Knights because of that. And and of course, oh, sorry, you can, you can go, Coral. All right. Uh, for like, you know, with Vegas, they sell out pretty much every single game. It, it, the atmosphere is like as good, if not better, than these original six teams like Toronto, like Chicago, those kind of teams. But I don't feel as if a team like Seattle would have the same kind of connection with their team. I don't know if you feel the same way. Um, I'm really interested in Seattle because I think... I mean, they get to follow the same expansion rules that the Golden Knights did. For whatever people said that they rigged it to make Golden Knights good, I don't, I don't agree with that at all. But uh, the fact is that the expansion rules, they, they do make the team more competitive than past expansions have. So I think that Seattle isn't going to be, you know, bottom of the barrel of the Pacific that first year. And um, the thing about Vegas, too, was in addition, like we had just talked about the shooting, this was the first major league team in Vegas. They had had yeah. UNLV basketball was really popular and they had minor league baseball here but the Raiders weren't here yet this was the first major league team and you go you look at a team place like Seattle like they've been a major league city for a long time they've got the Mariners they had the Supersonics they've got the Seahawks are obviously big up there and even smaller I don't want to say smaller sports but other than like kind of the big four you got the Seattle Sounders are really popular there and the Seattle Storm and the WNBA are really popular so I mean, whether or not it's going to be like Vegas, I don't think that they're going to go to the Stanley Cup final their first year. But I think that kind of a uh, uh, a good sports city like Seattle um, kind of fits what the NHL is looking for. And uh, I'll just say I can't wait for that first road trip up there. Also in the first year, of course, in Vegas' uh, season, you know, like you said, they made made it to the cup final. Um, you know, we know Vegas is a party city. Um, how was the hype there? Of course, it must have been, you know, spectacular. Man, I can't even explain it. It was awesome. yeah. <laughs> like they had these they had these parties outside for the for the playoffs outside of the arena in this giant plaza. And I mean it's it's hot everywhere in the summertime, but I mean when it's 110 degrees and you're wearing these big heavy hockey sweaters that are you know dark gray. They, oh yeah. They're the, they're oh yeah. Um, it was it was insane, and everybody wanted a piece of the Golden Knights action. And there were watch parties at every casino, and there were you couldn't go anywhere without seeing Golden Knights. Flags on cars and bumper stickers and everything. And it was, I mean, how many places have Lil John is a hype man outside for Stanley? Yeah. <laughs> and they have all this going on. It's, I mean, there's so many celebrities that either work here or live here that everybody just wanted a piece of it. And it was, it, it was so much fun. Oh, right. I, can, I can imagine. Um, so now, you know, I kind of want to talk about the Knights' offseason a little bit. Um, you know, obviously over the summer, they added a huge free agent, probably the best free agent, according to some, in Alex Petrangelo, um, you know, resulting Nate Schmidt to be traded. But, um, you know, what's their initial thoughts on the signing and how good of a pair will Shea Theodore and Alex Petrangelo be for that team? 
Well, I think I, I'm a, I'm a big believer, and you want you want star power to win, and they like you said they went out and got the biggest the biggest star that was available, and it, it's funny that this team keeps doing that. Like Petrangelo isn't the first star they got. They got Robin Leonard at the trade deadline. They signed Max Patch or, or traded for Max Patch already. They traded for Mark Stone even at the expansion draft. Mark Andre Fleury, even James Neal was a really big name when they got him. Um, so they just keep on going out and getting these guys. I, I think that having a top five, top ten defenseman in the league doesn't make you worse. Um, as far as pairing goes, I'd actually, I actually don't think he will be paired with Theodore. I think that oh, wow. being able to keep, I actually think being able to keep them apart is something that they really like. Uh, the idea of having one of those two on the ice for forty-five minutes of the game. Uh, they really love how Shea Theodore worked with Alex Alec Martinez in the playoffs and. Um, I think that that's something that we're going to see a lot of is potentially a, a Martinez Theodore on one pair and Braden McNabb and Alex Petrangelo on the other. That way you can have one of Petrangelo or Theodore on the ice for, you know, more than two thirds of the game. Uh, that's, that's, that's a pretty valuable thing to have. That is. And you know what? I, I believe that Shea Theodore is one of the most underrated players in the league. I don't think anyone understands how good of a defenseman this guy is. Like how much of a impact does he have on that Vegas team? I mean, you watched it in the playoffs, and there were times, uh, especially in that Vancouver series, that he kind of was the offense. Like, yeah. he, he's been good for a while, and we in Vegas had, we were like, yeah, this guy's going to be real good. This guy's good. He's not getting enough attention. I think during the playoffs, he kind of had a, a bit of a coming out party where everybody realized just just how good he was. And it was, it, it was funny, because when he started that first year, he was pretty immediately uh, an impact uh, on the offensive side of things. And he was, it was like, okay, he's going to be a good offensive defenseman, but, you know, can his play in his own end improve to the point that he's not just a, a fourth forward out there? And, and and that's definitely been the case that you look at it, he finished sixth in the Norris this season, and those votes came in before the playoffs even happened. So I think you're looking at Petrangelo and Theodore as maybe, you know, maybe having two of the top 10, 15 defensemen in the entire league on the same team. Uh, yeah, you said it. He's underrated, but uh, I don't think he's going to be underrated for too much longer. <laughs> um, also, another thing, uh, of course, you said Theodore's an amazing offensive defenseman. Um, does his power, do you think his power play time decreases in Vegas? Or do, do you think they're, they're going to put Petrangelo and Theodore in one pair with guys like Martian Stowe and, and William Carlson? That's a good question because when. Theodore ran the first power play unit, and they ran four forwards and Theodore at the top. The second unit was Nate Schmidt and Alec Martinez were both out there. So I'm curious if they want to move to a four forward setup for the second unit and have Theodore run one and Petrangelo the other, or like you said, have have them both out there at the same time is kind of a scary prospect too. But uh, Theodore is, is, is really good at the point, running kind of quarterback in that power play from the top of the umbrella. Uh, I'll... Admit I haven't watched uh, Petrangelo as closely as I have Theodore, so I'm interested to see how they'll deploy him as well. But uh, they're both going to get power play time as far as decreasing. Uh, maybe maybe a couple, maybe you know, a couple of seconds a game if he's not out there for you know a minute and a half of the two minute power play. He's closer to a minute because they have Petrangelo as an option now. But uh, I think Theodore's still going to get plenty of power play time. All right, sounds good. Um, obviously, there's another big move over the offseason where uh, the Knights extended Robin Lehner to, I believe, a 5x5. Five five. Um, it kind of caused a controversy. Um, even during the playoffs where um, Fleury's agent, of course, said he w- uh, Peter DeVore's quote-unquote stabbing him in, in the back, which, you know, that's a that's a thing for – that's another story. Um, but, um, you know, do you think um, the Vegas – do you think the Knights do something with Fleury? Because $7 million for a backup is a lot. Um, you know, especially if you have a top 10 goal in a league in laner, um, you know, is there anything on that per se? I think the, I think if they were going to do something this off season, they would have already done it. I think, uh, kind of, you get that flurry of activity at the very beginning of free agency and a couple of trades right before it to make sure everybody's cap is, is in the right spot. And I think that they tried to move flurry and they just weren't getting any takers. I mean, that's a 36 now year old goalie who just had one of the worst seasons that he's had, uh, in a long time. And. He's got two years left on his contract at a $7 million cap hit in a market that there were so many goalies available that I think teams checked in on it but just decided to go in other directions. Um, and you're right, $7 million is a lot, and 
that's $12 million devoted to the goaltending position. Only Montreal has more, and they, of course, have <laughs> Carey Price. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens, I think, at this point with a shortened season. It might be a condensed schedule that they're planning yeah. on moving into the season with both Leonard and Flurry. Uh, I think I don't think they would have traded Nate Schmidt away had they planned on moving Flurry's contract this offseason at this point. So uh, I think we're going to see both of them, and uh, next offseason probably another another try at moving Flurry's contract out. All right, thanks. Uh, do you uh, – because uh, Flurry is my favorite player for a long time now. Uh, t- but – do you think that he has any chance of getting back to his old form when he was considered the best goalie of the decade? Uh, do you think he can take over that starting spot from Laner again? Um, I mean, nothing's impossible, I suppose, but I think the Golden Knights plan on Robin Leonard being their goalie, both in the present and the future. Otherwise, uh, they wouldn't assign him to the big contract that they did. I mean, he's now locked up for five more years. I think they saw Flurry, who's, you know, six years older, seven years older than, than Leonard is, and probably looking at Flurry and thinking that his best hockey is behind him. Um, and that's not to say that Flurry's, you know, washed or anything like that. I mean, I feel, still think he's going to have an impact. And we're looking at potentially 56 games in this next season based on a couple of reports. And maybe that's Leonard for 30 and Flurry for 26. But we saw in the playoffs, both guys were healthy and uh, Leonard started 16 of the 20 games. So I think they've, uh, they've pretty much made their mind up on which goalie is their guy going forward. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, uh, we know that the Knights are a contender, maybe this year more than, uh, the last, uh, a short snippet of, of something you'd write when the Knights win their first Stanley Cup. <laughs> uh, wow. Um, I don't know, right? Because it takes, there's, there's so much that goes into it. I yeah. mean, how, how do they win? Do, is it, I mean, does Mark Stone have a 50 goal season or, I mean, in a shortened season, he won't, but I mean, is it Robin Leonard that's a Vesna contender? Do Alex Petrangelo and Shea Theodore carry the offense? How does that final game go? There's, I mean, there's a million different things that go into it, but the fact that if they were to win this season, they'd win it in their fourth season. Um, I would imagine that would be the fastest expansion team to win the cup. I guess I'd have to look that up to make sure, but just kind of, you recap the story of everything that's happened and how, how these players got to Vegas and how they were all able to melt together to, to win a cup in year four, which would be, which would be a pretty incredible feat. So, uh, I wish I could give you more than that, but there's just so much that, uh, that so many factors that could go into it, who they beat, who they play, how they win, that kind of thing. And that's also, uh, maybe a couple of steps ahead of ourselves there. (laughs) So you, so does that mean like you're not completely sure that they're going to win this year or? Well, I don't think you can ever be completely sure, right? Yeah. I think they're, uh, I mean, they're one of the favorites for sure. I, uh, I like their chances coming out of the West better than, um, you know, they're, they're going to be one of the favorites in the West. I think Colorado's really good. And I think a Colorado Vegas Western Conference final would be something that I'd pay pretty good money to watch. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I don't think you look back a year ago, I don't think anybody expected Dallas to come out of the West last year. So um, you never know what could happen. They came within one. You know, one goal of uh, Vancouver knocking them out in game seven of the second round. So even the best teams, Tampa's, we've thought of them as the best team in the league for about five years now. And they, quote, unquote, finally won their first cup. So uh, uh, of this run anyway. So you never know. I'm not going to go out and uh, predict a Golden Knights championship. But uh, I think they're definitely in a good spot to compete for it. You know, I read one of your articles and I and I really liked it. It was the one where you've. Uh, we're trying to pinpoint which players would perform better and which players would perform worse. Um, who is your dark horse on the Vegas Golden Knights this year? To have a better season than they did? Yeah. Um, geez, that, uh, that article wasn't that long ago, but I'm already having trouble remembering it. Um, <laughs> one one player who I who I really like is Alex Tuck, and that's that's yeah. probably not uh, not going too far out on a limb, but you look uh, two years ago. Uh, He was fantastic. He had a great season. He had, you know, 20-something goals, 50-something points. They had just signed him to this extension. And then, funny enough, uh, Mark Stone's arrival kind of uh, started Tuck's little bit of a decline from him. He was bumped off of that top six into the third line because they had, you know, Riley Smith and Mark Stone were their top two right wingers. So Tuck had to kind of adjust to a new role, and uh, I think – he struggled with that a little bit at first, and then last year he was injured uh, more than once, had trouble. But then in the playoffs this year, he was healthy and he led the team in goals. So uh, if I was 
If I was a bet man and had to pick someone to uh, have a good season, I think Alex Tuck is uh, is a sleeper for your uh, for your fantasy hockey teams out there. <laughs> I really like Tuck. He's a good player. <laughs> yeah, he, he's good. Um, speaking about on the roster itself again, um, obviously I believe this is the fourth year of Vegas of uh, the Knights' of season coming up, and uh, they still don't have a captain yet. So, do the Vegas going to nice name a captain this upcoming season? Yes, and uh, Pete DeBoer has said that. I think that was uh, kind of a Gerard Gallant thing, that he didn't necessarily want to have a captain. Pete DeBoer has said unequivocally he plans on uh, the Golden Knights having a captain this year. It'll be interesting to see who it is. I think there's one one heavy favorite for that job, and I think it's Mark Stone. I think yeah. uh, just he fits the mold of the traditional captain, right? Kind of best player, highest paid player, uh, the guy that's out there that everybody kind of looks to and – I just remember when he arrived on the team, like the team had a lot of good players. Max Pacioretty was on the team at the time. He was captain of a captain of an original six team. But when Stone arrived, I think it was kind of the cash of player that they just had never quite had. And when he got there, he changed the dynamic of the team. And I think uh, that's that would be your captain for next season. Though uh, you know there are there are a couple options on the team too, but uh, I don't think yeah that is as good as Stone. Uh Pete DeBoer, you did mention him. Do you? There were a lot of other options for that um, head coaching spot. I bet Mike Babcock was out there as a name. Do you think that Pete DeBoer is the right option? Do you have, or did you have a better one in your mind? It, well, it's funny because you didn't have a whole lot of time to think about it. I remember it was on a road trip. Yeah. It was a four-game road trip to Buffalo, Ottawa, Montreal, and Boston. And that was a trip that I wasn't on. It was right before the All-Star break. I was getting ready to have some time off. And um, I woke up one morning to a press release saying that the Golden Knights had fired Gallant and had hired DeBoer. So those happened at the same time. So, And at the time, we didn't even know that Gallant was on the hot seat at all. We, uh, we just kind of thought, all right, they're going through a bit of a rough patch right now. But this guy won the Jack Adams two years ago. Yeah. So to see him get fired was as much of a surprise to see the guy that they replaced him with. Because DeBoer was the coach of the Sharks. They had just had that seven-game series in the playoffs the year before that ended – with the uh, the major that might not have been a major penalty, um, <laughs> and the, uh, the the Sharks kind of famous comeback, and uh, the fan base didn't like DeBoer. He was he was the enemy. He was the bad guy. He was the guy that was uh, Gallant's adversary in that postseason. So to see him as the coach was was surprising. And was he the right choice for the job? Uh, it's hard to argue with uh, the results. Uh, little little stumbles coming out of his first couple of games, but that's to be expected. And. After the bye week, he got to implement his system a little bit. They went on an eight-game winning streak in February. They went to the Western Conference Final. Um, I, I think DeBoer was – if you were going to make that move, which, again, I'm not sure was was entirely expected or even necessary. I, I thought Gallant was a good coach, but they decided that they wanted to make this move, and if that was the choice, I think I think DeBoer was a good option. Speaking about Gallant, um, you know, of course, he was there for two and a half years. Um, you know, obviously, he's won a couple of Jack Adams. Do you think he gets a job soon? Yeah. Yeah, I'm surprised he hasn't already. Um, I think he got connected to Detroit because of his friendship with Steve Eiserman. Uh, yeah. Seattle would be interesting, considering his uh, recent success with an expansion franchise. Um, but, um, no, I don't I, – I would be surprised if he – Obviously, all the coaching jobs are filled for this season, but going into the 21-22 season, I'd be surprised if uh, Gerard Gallant wasn't uh, wasn't a bench boss somewhere. Oh, so and along, oh yeah, go ahead, Chad. Sorry, uh, you know, and along with the expansion draft, um, you know, 2017 was crazy. We saw a lot of trades being um, you know made before the draft happened. A lot of trades were made during the draft, of course. Um, do you think we'll see around the same amount of trades as we saw last time, or do you think teams are going to cool it down a bit because they know? how much the success the Vegas Golden Knights had. I think they're going to cool it down a little bit. I think we're going to see an overcorrection that will involve players. Because you look at – you look at basically Vegas, they gave them Riley Smith in order to take Marshall so, and the Wild gave them uh, Alex Tuck in order to take Eric Halla instead of losing – I think it was Matt Dumba they were trying to protect at that time. So would the Wild have been better off instead of losing Hala and Tuck to just lose Dumba? Eh, maybe. So I think teams are going to look at that and just go, you know what, I think we'd rather lose one player here instead of give up a give up a prospect or a first-round pick in order to protect somebody else. So maybe we'll see a little bit of that, but I don't think as much as we saw with the Vegas draft. All right. Um, I was wondering because – reporting in like a covid world how how much different is it from just the normal world you can't 
Uh, is it like you can't get close to the players? You not go in a locker room, that kind of thing. Yeah, I haven't. I mean, I haven't been into a locker room since March. Um, uh, you talk to these players over Zoom now, and I'm talking to you guys is the way that we months. Yeah, uh, these players, you don't get to go into the locker room and you know really start building those relationships and pick up on the stories they can't really get over Zoom. So reporting is very different, but as with everything and in every industry, we're we're adjusting and uh, we'll get by it and uh, just hoping that it get back, gets back to normal sooner rather than later. Um, just one more question on um, next season. Uh, obviously, w- with COVID, um, you know, we're probably going to have a shortened year, probably different di- different divisions. Um, you know, whatever division the Vegas Golden Knights are in, whether that's the Pacific or another one, um, do you think they'll finish uh, first place in that division again? Uh, I would say it depends on... Uh, where they are. I just wrote a story uh, just this weekend talking about how moving Edmonton, Vancouver, and Calgary out of the Pacific Division into this proposed all-Canadian division uh, removes the three biggest threats to the Golden Knights in the Pacific, right? Like Arizona and the California teams are still there, but I don't think anybody... um, I shouldn't say it like that. I'd, I'd be surprised, I guess, if they were a major threat to the Golden Knights in the Pacific. But if they were to realign, well, the next closest team geographically is Colorado. So if you move Colorado into Vegas's division, suddenly you're looking at a potential Western Conference final that could end up being a first or a second round matchup. So um, I would say that Vegas is in real position to win their division. Uh, but if Colorado comes into it, I think that would be the biggest the biggest obstacle. But uh, if you look at teams like if Dallas were to come into their division or um, – you know, there's always a team or two every year that we don't expect. Is this the year that the the Ducks or the Kings take a step forward and become Pacific Division contenders? I don't think a lot of people expect that, but you can never really rule it out. Um, as well as to that, um, of course, the Vegas Golden Knights have a lot of y- good young rookies. Um, you know, guys like Peyton Krebs and Cody Glass. Do you think they'll make an impact this upcoming season? Yeah. And, uh, you know, struggled a little bit in his rookie season, uh, was hurt, uh, missed the end of it, didn't go to the playoff bubble. Uh, Peyton Krebs, I'm not as sure about. Uh, he still has years, he still has junior eligibility, so I would imagine he plays next season with the Winnipeg Ice. But um, Glass, I would I would expect, uh, they expect him to be uh, either the number two or the number three center this year. So he's, he's going to have a big role. Right. Um. I, if no one has any further questions, um, doesn't look like we do. Um, uh, uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Emerson for coming on to this podcast. I know, um, last couple of weeks have been hectic in the NHL and, uh, you know, just in the world itself. And, uh, we thank you for coming on, taking your time. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks guys. I appreciate being on. Thanks.